Good evening, or afternoon. It's so bright out. It feels like the middle of the day. It's warm. I'm Harold Holzer, and I want to welcome you to Roosevelt House on behalf of Hunter President Jennifer Rabb. When, uh, when Jennifer Rabb created Roosevelt House, and she really did save, rehabilitate, and repurpose it, uh, until its reopening about 10 years ago. She wanted it to be a center of Hunter College centers. And uh, that was always an important part of our mandate. And so it's fitting that as we enter the last month of her 22-year presidency of Hunter College, we're starting the month uh, with an event here at Roosevelt House Public Policy Center that brings one of our fellow sister colleague centers to our doors for a major event. But I did want to acknowledge Jennifer, and I'm going to be doing that at all the events that we have until the end of her tenure. So as you know, we're a center of policy discussion, human rights discussion, in honor of our famous residents, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, who lived here for the 25 years leading up to the presidency. Uh, and just a few floors upstairs, where some of us were just preparing for this event, the foundational building blocks of the New Deal were forged by Roosevelt, his brain trust, and of course, the great Frances Perkins, who arrived here one day for her job interview and made it a precondition of her accepting the job as Secretary of Labor and the first woman in a presidential cabinet. The idea that Roosevelt would work for minimum wage, maximum hours, child labor laws, and of course, social security. Um, so all of that was created or first discussed here at Roosevelt House. And that's by way of saying that it's a special pleasure to welcome Hunter's Asian American Studies Center back to Roosevelt House, and particularly its director, about whom more in a moment. It, it, we just missed AAPI month, but it's kind of May 31st, June 1st. <laughs> we planned it for AAPI month, but legislative session, all the uh, finals, uh, you know, those things came between us, but we're on the cusp or on the back end, whatever you call it. We're very happy that we got together. Um, speaking of the legislative session, we would hope that Grace Lee could join us. She was on, our, on your invitations, but uh, she is stuck in Albany, but we want to acknowledge her. She's the first Korean-American woman in the state legislature. <coughs> so she's the Frances Perkins of the Korean-American community. We, we wish she could have been with us. We are happy to welcome, and you'll hear more about these people in a moment, but we're help, happy to welcome Joe Schmidt from the New York City Department of Ed's Social Studies Department. Joe says he heard me speak years ago and still remembers it, so he's my favorite <laughs> participant of the day. John, I'm sorry, but you know. Um, and I am thrilled personally and on behalf of Roosevelt House that State Senator John Liu is here, someone I've admired and worked with in my previous life <coughs> at the Metropolitan Museum, uh, the former controller of the city of New York and the first Asian, uh, Asian American elect, citywide elected official in our history. So it's another truly historic figure. And we, we did say upstairs that, that he attended Hunter High School for a while, so he's practically an alum, but he switched to Bronx Science, <laughs> which proves that nobody is perfect, not even John Liu. <laughs> nobody is perfect except maybe for Vivian Louie. She is the Professor of Urban Policy and Planning and Director of the Asian American Studies Center and Program at Hunter College. She's written about the elements that could go into workplace success among immigrant families and their children, and she's just a great colleague. Her books include Compelled to Excel, Immigration, Education, and Opportunity Among Chinese Americans, Keeping the Immigrant Bargain, the Costs and Rewards of Success in America, and the co-edited volume, Writing Immigration, Scholars and Journalists in Dialect, in Dialogue, 
Most relevant to this evening's discussion, she is a lead scholar for the forthcoming Hidden Voices AAPI Curriculum and Resource Guide from the New York City DOE, the subject that brings us together this evening for what we need to know about the Asian American experience. And with that, it's a pleasure to turn over the program to the, the person who conceived it, Dr. Vivian Louie. Hello, good evening, welcome everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Harold. Um, and thank you so much to your wonderful staff here, which I'll, whom I'll thank later on tonight as well. And many thanks to President Rob and to the provost here at Hunter College and their remarkable teams. Um, again, I also wanted to extend a thank you to Assemblymember Grace Lee who couldn't join us today, um, but we miss her. And I wanted to extend a big um, gratitude to New York State Senator John Liu for joining us tonight. Um, directly from Albany and we're so appreciative and you do amazing work. I'm just gonna kind of uh, amend, abridge my introductions if that's all right in the interest of time because I know that um, Senator Liu has a hard stop um, at 545. So I just wanna make sure that we respect and honor um, the generous time that he's giving us tonight. Um, I also am just so delighted that Joe Schmidt is here tonight. Um, he is a senior instructional specialist in the New York City Department of Education's Department of Social Studies. And we're gonna be gathering in a conversation tonight um, about uh, what we need to know about the Asian American experience, why it's important and how we've gotten to this time. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to um, Joe and his amazing team uh, around the Hidden Voices AAPI curriculum and resource gu guide that's forthcoming, um, as well as I want to give a shout out to the amazing team of lead scholars um, with whom I had the pleasure of working with on this project, including a team from Hunter College. Um, Dr. Lynn Ahn, who unfortunately could not join us tonight, Chris Kwok, who is in the audience, um, uh, Dr. Caitlin Goulding, uh, who is uh, also at Hunter, so proud to have worked with them, uh, along with Frida Lynn of the URI uh, Education Project, of which um, Dr. Goulding is co-director, and Dr. Kiati Joshi of Fairleigh Dickinson. And so I think um, with that, uh, oh, I have one final thing. Yes, I do want to give a shout out and gratitude to President Rob. Um, she is departing after 22 years of amazing service to Hunter College. And today, Asian American Studies at Hunter College, we educate the most students in Asian American Studies throughout the City University of New York. And we also um, offer the most courses. We educate about more than 1,100 students every academic year, and we graduate 30 to 40 minors a semester. So I wanted to thank her. Um, and then the Asian American City Center as well brings wonderful folks uh, like the ones here tonight into a gathering, and we will miss her. And so with that, I will invite um, Senator Liu and Joe to the stage, if that's okay. So, um, so uh, yes, thank you again so much. I wanted to, to welcome you to the stage and also just to start off the conversation of why is it important that we know about the Asian American experience? It's, it's important for a lot of reasons, but I'll give you the most direct reason right now. We've had, we've had now three years of unprecedented anti-Asian hate. Uh, you know, I, I grew up with a fair amount of it myself, but I, th I largely thought that was well in the past, given the, the increase in the Asian American population here in New York City and beyond. But these last three years, I mean, my goodness, I, I never thought I would see it all again. And you know, as peop people in the community are outraged, uh, legislators, my, many of my colleagues, they've talked about what needs to be done to combat the anti-Asian hate. People have said, well, the hate crimes laws need to be strengthened or bolstered um, legislatively. You know, I, I, I suppose that's one thing that we could do, a boost hate crimes legislation. I think at this point, though, most people have forgotten what hate crimes legislation really is, which is, it's a bonus. 
you get additional prison sentence if the violent crime that you commit was because of your own hate. Very difficult to prove, as we have experienced in the last few decades. And honestly, I don't know if someone's going to stop and think, well, wait a second, if I attack this Asian person because she or he is Asian, I might face an additional five years on top of the 20 years of prison that I'm facing, so maybe I won't do it. I just don't know if that logic actually happens in real life. And so, you know, I, I thought long and hard about it with my, many of my colleagues, and I, we, we understand that the root of hate and bigotry is fear and ignorance. Fear because millions of people have died in this global pandemic. And ignorance because unfortunately to this day and age, uh, and it's something that Hunter College is clearly trying to address directly, not a whole lot of people know a lot about Asian Americans. We're just very invisible. 2,000 Americans, a couple of years ago, 2,000 Americans were surveyed asked a simple question, name an Asian American. <laughs> now, uh, you know, if someone were to ask me that question, I would, I would say, oh, Glenn McPante, because, you know, he is our commissioner of civil rights at the federal level, and, and of course, importantly, a, an adjunct right here at Hunter College. <laughs> and I, actually, I worked with Glenn for a long time. He, he, he for a long time, he, he knows, Glenn, you remember when I used to actually have a full head of hair? <laughs> okay, he still has his, all his hair. I don't know how he does it, but, uh, but 2,000 people, name one Asian American, <laughs> and 58% couldn't name a single one. And of the 42% who could name somebody, the most common response was Jackie Chan. <laughs> I mean, I think he's a little bit goofy intentionally, um, but, you know, he, Jackie Chen is from Hong Kong. He's not Asian American. And the second most common response was Bruce Lee. Now, I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee, but uh, rest is whole, he's been dead for 50 years. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a sad commentary, but a, a vivid example of how Asian Americans are still very invisible. And why is that relevant? Well, you know, when people are afraid and they want to blame somebody for whether it be a, an economic recession, uh, international conflict, or global pandemic, blame the people that you just don't know a whole lot about. And not, not only that you don't know a whole lot about, but the president, no less, says it's these people's fault by calling it the Chinese virus. Or, you know, Trump single-handedly coined a new anti-Asian epithet, the Kung flu. And so, uh, so, you know, it's, I feel like to, to address hate and bigotry, you have to get at the root cause. You have to eradicate the ignorance and have to teach generations of school kids what Asian Americans are all about. That, you know, we're not just this model minority or perpetual foreigners, certainly not this yellow peril that brought COVID to the shores of America, but really to, to teach how we've contributed to this country for 150 years, that, that we've had struggles as well as successes, that we've worked with other communities of color, the whole gamut. And it's just, it, it then becomes a lot easier to hate somebody and certainly to attack somebody that you actually know something about. It's much easier to attack people that you just don't identify with. You don't even consider them American, possibly American. Uh, you, you don't, in some cases, you don't even consider them human. So I, that's why I feel it's, it's important to build on what has already occurred here with Professor Louie and Hunter College and Asian American Studies and bring it into our public schools. And that's what we're trying to do legislatively, Grace Lee and myself. Thank you so much. Um, Joe, do you want to talk about Hidden Voices? Sure. Um, so Hidden Voices is a larger curricular project that actually goes back several years. Um, began with work with the Museum of the City of New York, who had their new exhibition, New York at its Core. At that time, we had just finished up our K-12 to social studies curriculum, and we sort of worked on the premise that our work is never done. And so even though our social studies curriculum is about 20 to 25,000 pages of curricular materials, 
we knew we could do better in terms of representation. And at that time, we focused on New York City history. We focused on greater representation around gender and across the gamut <coughs> folks of color. But we really, really wanted to kind of continue that work past that project. And then our first question was, where do we really have areas where we need to develop greater representation? Um, that led us to the LGBTQ project. Um, where we worked with a group of historians and other scholars to create a guide. And I should stop and say, our premise is the first thing when we talk about greater representation in a curriculum, teachers need to develop their curriculum knowledge, their content knowledge. So, and I'll get to talk about AAPI history and content in just a moment. But whenever we talk about representation, we really need to start with the educators. <laughs> So it's not just about lessons, it's actually saying, teachers, what do you need to know? And so we create these guides with the intent of getting them into teachers' hands first. So we created an LGBTQ guide with 22 profiles of LGBTQ figures from throughout United States history. We were asked to create a set of lessons, and at roughly that same time, a conversation began about the AAPI work. And we wanted to use the LGBTQ template of working with scholars to create a guide for teachers and also to expand the set of lessons. And, and part of the conversation at that point was it needs to go beyond social studies as well. And so we began drafting lessons not just for social studies classrooms but also for ELA, for STEM, for the arts. Um, and now we are at the point where we just sent off the Hidden Voices, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders in United States History, Teacher's Guide to be printed, 30,000 copies, about 10 copies each will be sent to all of the 1,800 New York City schools. We have others that we use for professional learning purposes. And then we also make these materials available for anyone. So you can go online and download the Teacher's Guide. And as we wrap up the Teacher's Guide, we then begin to focus on the lesson plans and other ancillary materials. And this goes to um, uh, Congressman, or sorry, Senator Liu's point about kind of seeing AAPI folks. So part of our ancillary materials are actually creating posters. So when students walk into classrooms, they're gonna see Corky Lee in a poster on, the, on their you know, in their social studies or in their English classroom. They're gonna see comic books. We just finished a, our first comic book as part of this called Who Belongs, which talks about, and I think it really, at its root, the most important thing is to get people to think about, as folks unfortunately think about othering, it's really about AAPI history is not something separate. AAPI history is US history. This is something we go back to talk about St. Malo. We go back to not just talk about a group of 15,000 laborers in California working on the railroads, but actual individuals. And so we're creating comic books that talk about how when we talk about the idea of citizenship, that idea of citizenship in the United States is central to the US historical narrative, but it is also central to the AAPI narrative. And all of those folks from the larger community that were part of that fight to define what citizenship is in the United States. So we have that comic book that will be put into every kid's hands because the other thing is it's about scale. So we're printing 150,000 copies of that comic book to get into kids' hands to tell that story. And it is gorgeous, and it is written by one of the leading comic creators. His name is Greg Pak. If you're into comics, we can talk about him. He's fantastic. Um, and so that's what the Hidden Voices Project's about. It's about building knowledge. It's about fighting back against the othering, fighting back against the fear and the ignorance. And it's about saying AAPI history is United States history. AAPI topics are topics that you should be looking at. And actually, I'm glad that today is June 1st and not May, you know, because it's actually not just about teaching this during Heritage Month. It's not just talking about it during May, but talking about it all year long. Mm -hmm. And I've been talking for a while, so I'm gonna stop. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> um, Senator Liu, um, so you've done, thank you, Joe, and you've done amazing work in this space. Uh, you briefly alluded to the bill that you've introduced with Assemblymember Grace Lee around this, right, of mandating. Uh, inclusion of Asian American history throughout the state in um, our public schools. So I wonder if you could say more about that and, and your efforts, I mean, they date back several years, many years around this, so if you could. Thank you. Um, 
we're, we're pushing ahead with the legislation. Um, it's not easy to pass, believe it or not. You'd think that it's a slam dunk. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, I've been at it for three years. We, I first introduced the legislation with Assemblyman Ron Kim, who was the first Korean American member of the legislature. And then when Grace joined us in the legislature this year, uh, Ron handed it over to Grace, and so we're spearheading the effort in our respective chambers. Um, the, so it, it takes a lot of work, and there's a much broader coalition called the REACH Coalition, which is composed of dozens of Asian American organizations throughout New York and some beyond to advance this legislation in the New York legislature. Other states have passed legislation that requires Asian American studies to be included in the curricula for their schools. Uh, we haven't done so in New York, and yeah, I, there's a lot of reasons why, and that there's a lot of reasons why it's an uphill push. But the, the basic issue is that uh, unlike many other states where the legislation simply added AAPI, to an existing list of required curricula, such as African American studies, Latinx, Jewish studies, uh, and therefore AAPI studies, what's added to the existing statutes. Uh, there is no such statute in New York. In fact, uh, there's been a long 200 year history of uh, something called the Board of Regents which is the body that governs educational policy in New York State for centuries. And the, the thought has always been, no matter what party, there's always been a healthy respect for not, what some people would say, not politicizing what's taught in public schools. And so that that policy has generally been left up to the Board of Regents, who are not elected. They, you know, they serve for very long terms. They're generally uh, accomplished and, and mostly retired educators. Uh, so we don't tell the Board of Regents what to put in textbooks. On the other hand, there are some people who believe that the Board of Regents needs to adapt more quickly. Uh, and a, a case in point here, right here, is that uh, you know I've looked at some textbooks and materials that are being used in history books in New York, and they reference the completion of the transcontinental railroads, the various exclusion acts, and the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Honestly, it's the same references that I had in my history books a really long time ago, and nothing's been updated. Yeah, you know, I'm about to go to my high school's 85th gala tonight. I, I, would, I did not graduate from there 85 years ago. <laughs> Okay, but uh, you know, it's, it was a long time ago and they're still basically using the same textbooks. No, you know, no, no mention of Vincent Chin, no mention of the attacks against South Asians after 9-11, no mention of 20 years of the United States seeing China as the new adversary and therefore uh, accusing, in many cases, without, without any basis. Uh, prominent Chinese Americans of spying for China. <laughs> so uh, there are many of these issues that just aren't part of what's taught in, in public schools, and that continues to add, um, add to, our to our ongoing invisibility. So I think it has to be addressed. And, and I, will, I will say that uh, a long time ago when I was in college, you know, I didn't know anything about Asian American history in high school. I, you know, I, I've, throughout my life, I've always tried to dispel stereotypes, but honestly, I, you know, I was a, a, in, in high school and in college, I was a major in mathematical physics. So I really do a good job with dispelling stereotypes there. Didn't learn a whole lot about history, but in college, I learned history because I was active on campus and in student movements. And it was actually a speech by a former Hunter College professor, Shirley Hune, who, uh, encouraged me to, uh, to uh, not just me, but encouraged a whole bunch of us at a student conference to get involved. And uh, her main line, I, I still remember to this, to this day, which is, if, you know, if, if not now, when? And she continued to talk about how we always say, oh, we're going to do something later on, but we never do something right now. And so that actually uh, helped me uh, that th that inspired me to to do things 
that I thought were necessary. And at the time, uh, Asian American studies in on college campuses was the main thrust of our student activism through an organization called the East Coast Asian Student Union. And so uh, we, we, you know, Hunter College clear, clearly was a, a success story. Um, my college, Binghamton University, not so successful. <laughs> Well, uh, but now we're trying to get it to all grade levels in public schools. Wow, that's so great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I wanted to say that um, Dr. Shirley Hewn uh, is amazing. Actually, when we were coming down uh, earlier to, to this space, um, Senator Liu asked me, um, do you know of her or do you know her? And I said, I actually know her. I met her. And uh, she's been a wonderful mentor and a wonderful champion of Asian American studies nationally, globally, as well as um, at Hunter. And she, she was associate provost here from 1990 to 1992. And it was really thanks to her champion um, that Hunter moved forward to adopt the Asian American Studies um, program, which was launched in 1993 by the late Peter Kwong. So I think that that's just amazing what you've shared in terms of your personal connection, right? What was it like, if I may, <laughs> what was it like to kind of, to grow up without having this history taught. So how did you learn? How did you learn about the key concepts that you've raised, right, about the yellow peril, um, about the forever foreigner, um, about the model minority? You raised that in your remarks um, just a few minutes ago. Just for our audience, about Vincent Chun, what was your learning? What was your art? Well, <laughs> honestly, Professor, I I never learned any of this in an academic setting. It was always through being involved in student organizations and later on in community groups and efforts. Uh, but I, you know, even though I never experienced it from an academic setting, I have my own life experiences. Um, you know, I grew up here. I, I wasn't born here. I was I immigrated from Taiwan at the age of five. Um, and growing up in public schools, as I alluded to earlier, you know, when there were not so many Asians around, you grow up with your, fair, your share of, of slurs, gestures, comments, and, you know, outright attacks. And so, uh, um, you know, a lot of that's in the past. Again, I thought I'd never see it again, but now with the social media posts, it's, it's unbelievable what we've seen. Maybe I'll share uh, with you how I ran for office in the first place. You know, I was just minding my own business. I, I worked in finance. As I said before, I got my degree in mathematical physics, never took a, <laughs> a course in, in politics or running for office or anything like that. Um, but I was on the, on the 7 train coming to work in Midtown, and I looked at the paper, and there was a big front page article <laughs> about my city council member representing Flushing, who uh, you know uh, said that Asians, you know, the problem with Asians, well, Flushing was such a mess because of Asians, and the problem with Asians is that they oh they never try to assimilate; they just try to invade. These are her exact words, and that Asians are nothing more than rude merchants, illegal aliens, and criminal smugglers. And I was just, you know, I couldn't do any work that day. I was just livid. And, and you know, and then, and then I, I channeled some Shirley Hune. And so the following year, I ran for city council against that council member. So. Uh, Councilmember Harrison was my inspiration <laughs> to run for office, and uh, and and when I ran for office in Flushing, I got a lot of you know you the, the way you run for local office is you go door to door, you talk to people, voters, not a hundred at a time, one at a time, at their homes, and I got a lot of doors slammed in my face, and after the doors got slammed, you would hear on the other side of the door, I would never vote for a fucking chink like you. I got that a lot, and that was 1997, and then 2001 when I ran the second time because I didn't win the first time. 
And, you know, and now even today, or I should say five years ago when I ran for state senate, people still slammed their doors in my face. And I was a much older person. <laughs> and they, wouldn't, they, they would say not so much the same words. They would say, I would, after they slammed their door, I would never vote for someone like you. I knew exactly what they were talking about, even though they used different words. And that's the kind of experience that you know, I bring to legislative office. And it reminds us all that we need that representation matters. And that uh, we need not only legislation that requires this kind of teaching so that we become less invisible. It also means that we bring back resources. We have now this year a historically large $30 million allocation in the state budget for Asian American organizations. Um, and, and, you know, representation does matter. So that's kind of like my background. I was just a physics major, minding my own business, and then somebody pissed me off, and that's how I got here. Um, thank you so much. Uh, if, if, uh, no. <laughs> so I do know that you, I want to respect your time so that you can um, go to the 85th, is it the 85th? Anyway, uh, so the birthday celebration. And um, I wanted to know if there were any final concluding thoughts, reflections um, based, you know, that can kind of close your wonderful participation for which we are deeply grateful tonight. I mean, I, I, I have about three hours worth of concluding thoughts. <laughs> Is that okay, Mac? Mac? Thank you so much. Thank you. My name's Catherine Sidoti. I'm a Hunter College alumnus of many years ago. I'm actually doing my doctoral dissertation on Chinese women in the financial field. I actually came here to learn a little bit more. Um, and I also wanted to say something to Mr. Schmidt about um, some of these educational programs having a f many family members in the DOE for more than 30 years. And I'm also a psychologist. The what I see a problem is, is that when people look in the mirror, they don't like self. So when a person hates the self, how can they accept other? And this is what seems to be the biggest problem I've seen as a, as a coach and as someone who works psychologically with a lot of people. Don't, doesn't matter who it is, whatever race, color, creed, age group even, even some older people, that they don't like what they see or hear about their own inner self. And it really starts from that working in developing the pedagogy in, in uh, educational programs. So I wanted to echo you know, a lot of what you're saying. Uh, in my research, I just want to let people know, and doing my research, one of the things that, too, is you know, when, you're, when you're doing a lot of, a lot of people don't know, a very wonderful Chinese instrument is the koto. It, it's from China, most people don't know that. Um, my, I'm sorry, yeah. My question is, do you, Mr. Liu, do you have um, any, uh, since you're in finance, and do you have any of the latest statistics as where Chinese females are in the field of finance right now in terms of their upward mobility because the research shows they're not moving in upper echelons in the, of that? Thank well, you. Thank you. I, I look forward to seeing your research so I can figure out how, how many... Chinese professionals they are in, in finance, but I think yeah, I you know I take one of your points very seriously because you know the the self hate is important. That's also a critical important uh, critical component of teaching Asian American history and experience. You know, I, I, Professor Louis often asks me about my where I'm coming from. And there were when I was growing up in Bayside, and there were very few Asian families around, and I got a lot of shit at school, there were a period of several years where I just, I wish I was white. I didn't want to be Asian. And I tried to shed everything Asian about myself to try to look and be more white. And that's what happens with a lot of our school kids who are not seeing anything in their coursework about what it is to be Asian American. I got much more comfortable with myself after I went to Bronx Science where there were a lot of Asians. <laughs> And actually, even at Hunter College High School, there were a lot of Asians. So uh, over in Bayside at the time, there were very few, and it was not, not easy. So that's another reason why we need to have Asian American studies. I, I really apologize. I have to actually head to Great Neck right now. Uh, we have the, uh, the first Asian American running for Nassau County Legislature. 
and I need to speak to introduce him at his own fundraiser. And I have to schlep back to the Museum of Natural History, which is where <laughs> we have our Bronx Science 85th anniversary gala. So that's, uh, I, otherwise I would be here much, much longer. Uh, but I hope you'll do this again. Uh, I love coming to the Roosevelt House. Last time I was here was for, was on Equal Pay Day in 2013 when we were talking about the need to understand government pay disparities for women. And, uh, and it's always an enlightening time here at the Roosevelt House. So thank you, oh, Professor thank you. Louis. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I just, as you're leaving, I, it's really important from our perspective in, in New York City public schools, without your support for all of this work, it wouldn't be possible. So thank you so much. City and the Department of Education under the joint leadership and with the mayor's mandate, they said we don't have to wait for the state to pass their legislation. We can go ahead before the legislation is actually passed and do it in our New York City public schools. And a couple of other smaller <laughs> districts in Long Island and the West have done so already. So even proposing legislation makes an impact. But we're going to get it done. Thank you so much. Enjoy safe travels. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank yeah. Uh, actually, can we? Uh, I think what the plan is to just to continue our conversation, and then there'll be time for Q and A. Uh, what time are we at now? We're at uh, ten to six. Yes. So I think we have about ten minutes for conversation between um, Joe and myself. But I wanted to to your question very briefly. So you should consult the work of Hunter Professor. Uh, Margaret Chin in the sociology department. She wrote a fantastic book entitled Stuck. And she's also at the mm -hmm. CUNY Graduate Center. Okay? Thank yeah. You. Okay, Joe. So thank you so much. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about your personal connection um, to this work. I mean, we can't ever, you know, follow in his <laughs> no, lead, gonna... <laughs> but, you know, we'll do the best that we can. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah so, uh, when you sent this question um, a couple nights ago, I thought about it, and I have kind of three, and I'll try and keep them quick answers, and I'll do the deep history, sort of the recent history, and, and then uh, kind of the present. Um, the deep history is what really, I think, got me to think about this work and, and think about larger Asian American and Pacific Islander history and how to bring that into the schools was back in, before I was born, my folks were involved um, in left-wing politics, and through that got connected to the U.S.-China People's Friends Association. And actually, my mom traveled to China in February of 1975, and then my father in November of 1978. And so, kind of through that, as it really truly in diapers up to, um, you know, my youth, I got to know lots of folks and think primarily about the connections between the United States and China, but also kind of what did that mean and what did that transnational history mean? Um, so that's sort of, I guess, the long history. The, the shorter history gets into kind of my teaching um, and really, and I mentioned comics and I will always mention comics. Um, part of what brought me to this work was actually a comic or a graphic novel, um, which has just recently been made into a television series, American Born Chinese. Um, which is by Gene Yang, and if you've never read it, go out, you can read it in a night. It is a remarkable, remarkable book. It's the book, as I taught it, and this is going back about a decade, that really kind of transformed me to the importance of a lot of this history kind of more conceptually. You know, we mentioned the Yellow Peril, we mentioned the Forever Foreigner. Um, these ideas come up through that book, and very happy that actually Gene Yang and his son are working on a project with us now for next year's uh, comic uh, releases um, along with some others. Um, and then the recent history is really uh, getting the chance to work with you all, the support, the person who was at the time, um, who really made this happen wasn't me, uh, was Lucius Young who was the chief of our division. He has now moved on to a different position, but he really kind of had the will 
um, and worked with Senator Liu to kind of push this, to make sure that New York City led the way. And I think it, it is important to note that I actually agree with New, what New York State says, which is we won't pass a bill unless it can actually be a funded mandate when it comes to curriculum. There are lots of other states that have passed legislation, and they actually look to us because they're being told, you need to teach this, you need to bring it in, but they don't have the materials to do so. Um, and so it was really because of Lucius and some others in the current administration who said, we're gonna do this, we're gonna make these materials. Um, and hopefully, you know, one of the things I say when we talk about this is, maybe the state doesn't need to find the funds for the curricular materials, because we've now created them that everyone can use and we will continue to create them. So that's the short history of what brings me, I guess, to this table right now. Sure, thank you so much, Joe. And I wanted just to build on your point. So it's um, uh, American-born Chinese, right? Uh, that's on, is it on Netflix? Or? Uh, Disney Plus. Disney Plus, that's right, because um, Columbia professor Nai, historian and contributor to Hidden Voices, um, the AAPI uh, volume, and also just an award-winning historian, mm -hmm. um, was posting about that on, I think, social media recently. And I also wanted to give a shout out to um, Professor uh, Rebecca uh, Barakidwai, who teaches that in her class, Intro to Writing Asian American Lit, uh, here at Hunter College. Uh, but I wanted to also kind of get a, an understanding of what exactly is covered, right, in the Hidden Voices uh, resource guide. But before mm -hmm. I get to that, right, uh, to ask you, formally answer, uh, ask you that question, I do want to say that I wanted to define the terms um, mm -hmm. that Senator Liu uh, put out there, for just to make sure we're all on the same page uh, in the audience, uh, in the space here, and also in Zoom. So the idea of the forever foreigner, right, the, that idea has been used to characterize Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders for you know hundreds of years, but the idea that um, because of our ancestry, right, we can never actually ever become truly American. That we're just not uh, seen to be as uh, ever capable of being assimilated uh, or accepted is a better word, accepted um, as truly American. So that's one, you know, one idea that's been out there. The other is the yellow peril. And well, actually, why don't you define that for <laughs> us? Because I know you asked us to. <laughs> I'm going to say, can I actually? step back and because I think we can come to the sure defining. yeah yeah um, absolutely. and I actually want to speak to what you were talking about in terms of kind of what we might call mindsets within a k-12 space um, so the hidden voices through working with Vivian and the team of lead scholars including Chris um, we sat down we decided on a set of profiles um, but important is it's not just about introducing, I think it's all told now 38 biographies, so 38 profiles from sort of the beginning of US history, if you will, up to, we actually in this guide have, I think eight living folks who are in the guide, um, who are part of the profiles, including a couple of my favorites, including Pat Chin, uh, who Chris wrote about and who we've reached out to and who is just the nicest mm -hmm. person. But, let me back up a little bit. So we have the biographies, so the 38 profiles, but also what's really important and I think gets to the teacher content knowledge is situating those profiles in larger narratives. So each of the profiles are collected under what we call a portrait of an era, which is a period uh, or a periodization essay. Um, and Vivian and her team each wrote one of those portraits of an era, and then you have anywhere from five or six profiles in the early period to I think the last one has about 10 or 12 um, profiles. So that's the book in terms of the, the heart of the book. And then on the front end, there are a set of what we'll call pedagogical essays and one overview essay that Vivian and I believe Chris uh, contributed uh, to an overview narrative. And that's really where we start the work. And then we begin to think about when folks look in, and this, this um, metaphor uh, that gets used a lot in K-12 education of windows, mirrors, and sliding doors, we begin to think about you know, what are folks thinking about, what are their mindsets, and I think an important piece of this is for the first time we're having conversations 
with the people who do the larger professional learning. So it isn't mindsets without content, it's learning the content along with thinking about the mindsets that will hopefully begin to shift as people look at themselves in the mirror, and that's whoever they may be. Um, but also an important piece then, on the back side, after the profiles, we have a glossary. Because one of the things we have learned through this process is how important vocabulary is. And that we have to define these terms, we have to define these concepts, and not just short kind of Webster's dictionary definitions, but giving a little bit of the, this is what this concept means, this is why it's important. So you asked me to define the yellow peril. Yellow peril um, comes, it basically gets named through a painting that I believe, um, and Chris, you can remind me, was it Frederick? Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm uh, actually pays to have produced, which looks at this eminent threat coming from the east to it for him to Germany and, and Europe. Um, but it really gets applied to think about the, not just the foreignness, but the threat, either be it economically or socially, that folks at that point primarily from East Asia, but now we can think about it broadly. And it's one of these, it ends up being sort of a trope that gets applied. So, and I'll come back to comics. So you even see it in like the comic character of Fu Manchu is a representation of the yellow peril, this thing that is always villainous and always a threat to, and always, and this is very important, other from the Americans who are, you know, and when we really, and one of the things we talk about is oftentimes you have to put in parentheses the white Americans who are seen as the people who are threatened, or in the case of Kaiser Wilhelm, the white European. I think that may be a little bit long, but hopefully yeah, no, got the no. gist. That's wonderful. And it's 400 pages, right? Four, I think it's yeah. just under 450 pages. So I think it's like 442 when all is said and done. And then there's a digital version that will be available in September. Is that right? Actually, just oh. learned it oh. should be available <laughs> roughly at the same time that the hard copies are going to schools. Yeah, we, we th so anything that New York City government puts up or state government or U.S. Go has to be rightly so ADA compliant. So to get the guide into schools, we made a decision that we were going to focus on getting the hard copies into schools, and I thought that that meant that the digital version wasn't going to be available. But the digital version will be available by the end of June. Um, and what is important to note is, as I, I mentioned briefly, when we create these Hidden Voices materials, when we go through the permissions process, we make sure that it's not just New York City DOE teachers who can use it, but anyone can access. So if you go to We Teach and put in Hidden Voices, you'll get a bunch of stuff. If you go in in a couple of weeks, it's not there yet, and type in Hidden Voices, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, you'll get the guide, and then in a couple of weeks after that, the first set of posters will also be there. But anyone, and what's important to note, and part of kind of the larger context of right now is, we're doing something that's very different from, as you all know, what's happening in other places, right? Where there is a contraction of what can be taught, where there are limitations on what can be taught. We are actually putting these things forward, and one of the things we want, we want folks, and one of the things I loved through the Hidden Voices LGBTQ work is we are having folks from Texas say, look at this poster that we downloaded and I have on my door of Sylvia Rivera. And that's what we want. We don't just want this to be used in New York City. We want this to be used everywhere, and we make sure that that's available and possible. Um, the last thing I'll say is we also want criticism. We want folks to, you know, we know this isn't complete. We know this isn't perfect. And the only way to move these conversations forward is to think about how can we continue to do this better. Um, so we also invite, if, if you see something and you're like, well, let's do better, and we can, and as I said earlier, we, our work is never done. <laughs> That's great. Um, I think it's important to highlight the uh, the digital version as well because then that's just easy to access, right? And anybody can kind of download it. I think Mac, uh, if it's okay, if you can come down, if uh, we have a couple of minutes uh, yep. to invite Happy some to questions, questions from the audience. Uh, I think I see some well, some I hands up. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, Mac has the microphone, so. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, the person in the front, in the front row, yeah.
Thank you so much. Oh. I'm Michael Myers. I'm the president of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. My question to you is twofold. Number one, how do we prevent, in terms of the incorporation of Asian American issues and, and studies, how do we prevent segregation and separatism and stereotyping of Asians in terms of the curriculum? Because a lot of the people come with ideas of what Asians should be taught, how they should be taught about and, and, and imaged in American, in American history and American literature. So how do we prevent stereotypes um, other, than, other than the Charlie Chans? Um, that those kind of stereotypes. I'm talking about stereotypes that are positive on the part of so-called scholars, Asian scholars, including white scholars. How do you prevent people who are Asian saying only Asian studies can only, have to be only taught by Asians? How do you prevent that? And my sec second part of my question is the experience of blacks and, 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 a and Asians or Koreans, for example, in, in Brooklyn, the Church Avenue situation. You had blacks who knew about racism, who knew about segregation, who knew about racial idiocy, who, who marched on Church Avenue in Brooklyn against Korean merchants. And there was nobody, nobody other than the Civil Rights Coalition who stood up against that kind of racial rhetoric and, and separatism. And, and people, I remember Margaret Fung, who was head of the New Asian American Legal Defense Fund, Education Fund, she still is. We, we decided to march down Church Avenue in solidarity with the Korean merchants. And she met with the black militants the night before in Brooklyn. And, they just, and she decided we can't march down the church, church Avenue because the blacks would be furious with us. And we don't want that. So the only way she changed her mind was Asians came to our march, our unity march, and they insisted that we march down Church, Church Avenue. So how do you prevent idiocy on the part of people who are, who are involved and who are already knowledgeable about issues of, of racial segregation and, 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 and separatism? Yeah, I, and I definitely Thank want you. Vivian to step in as well. But I, I think I heard maybe three questions, so I'll try and take them one at a time. Um, and this was, the first one was sort of more implied. I actually think it's very important that this work that we reach out to Asian American scholars from the community to be a part of this. Um, in order to really have the conversation that was through the lens of, and not exclusive of, we're, we're then clearly I am a, a white American, and so I'm part of the conversation, but it is important that any of the work that we do, we work with folks from the community to be in the scholars team to create those materials. Or when we create the ancillary materials, we are working with folks from the community. And it, so that's representation, not just on the page, but the ideas that are expressed there. In terms of thinking about solidarity, I think that is a vital piece of the work. And so it's not just in talking about a figure like Yuri Kochiyama, who was maybe more so than anyone else, a great representation in New York City of someone who worked across, you know, not just racial lines, but class lines to work towards a more united America. Um, so we have those folks, but also developing lessons that look at solidarity. So we are working with, and I mentioned briefly the lessons, we're working with the Asian American Education Project to develop a set of lessons, I believe it's eight lessons, that look at cross-group solidarity, not just within the AAPI community, but also cross-group community solidarity between the black and the AAPI, AAPI community as well. And I think those lessons need to be taught. And then the third thing, that I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were sort of speaking to and asking about was how do we do this? Yes? No, the resentment of black schools towards the okay. to take over their place. Well, so I, I would push back on the idea of taking over, and I think that's, I think, and that gets to the vocabulary, right? I think part of it is we believe deeply that you can't just walk around these terms, you actually have to define these terms and introduce ways to teach about them. And including sometimes in 
including primary sources, that have these terms so we can actually get students to analyze how did these terms develop. And we have all sorts of language about how the pedagogy of doing that. Um, but I think it's also a question of we're not creating this as something separate. The first, and I, I'm not excluding the idea, I actually think getting to a place where we develop electives that use these materials that are either in ethnic studies or in Asian American studies is a good thing. But the first step, first step is to help the teachers develop their content knowledge. The second step is to show where within, in this case, the US history curriculum, these lessons, so these, this is not something separate. So every student, not just Asian American students, but every student who sits of the almost a million students who sit in New York City classrooms, which just, by the way, is about one in 350 people who live in the United States, one in 350 are sitting in a New York City classroom every day. So that is a major part of the United States and making sure that all of them get these lessons in their US history courses in that curriculum, but also, and this is an important piece, in their ELA classes, in their STEM classes, in their arts classes. So they can see, again, not just the Asian American students, but all the students in the classrooms, they can see and learn this history and learn this content. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I will get to you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I know you. So um, just to build on those great points, I mean, I wanted to bring back uh, Dr. Shirley Hume. Uh, into the conversation because she's written about this. Uh, again, um, she was a former associate provost here at Hunter who really championed to have Asian American studies be institutionalized here. Um, and she's written about the fact that we need to have Asian American studies or ethnic studies content, I mean, of course, in ethnic studies classrooms, but across different classrooms. And she's speaking about higher ed in particular, but this, you know, it's the same point, Joe, that you're raising. Um, in K through 12, that it shouldn't reside in one kind of dedicated classroom, but it should be infused throughout the curriculum. So I think that's important to understand. And then I wanted to say to your point, uh, to the question about the history that we uncover, right? So at Hunter College, since I've been here, um, I co-led with Dr. Lin Ong and uh, Rochelle Kwan and Luigi uh, Villanueva. The latter two are oral history educators uh, in the community. And basically we co-led a project with Hunter uh, students at that time. Uh, many of them have since graduated, but looking at the origins of Asian American studies at Hunter College, the many decades that led up to 1993 of alums, of faculty, of community leaders. And one of the things that we uncovered, or re-uncovered, if you will, was the foundational role of the Department of Black and Puerto Rican Studies, then named Black and Puerto Rican Studies, now named the Africana uh, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Department here. And in particular, the chair, Dr. John Henry Clark, who really, during his time here, um, gave shelter to a single Asian American Studies course that was offered. Um, sporadically from the 70s, the 80s, and into the early 90s. And then that's important to understand because the shelter is funding, it's staff support, it's classroom support. It's all the th behind the scenes work that we typically don't think about until you're actually doing that behind the scenes work. Um, but I know that Professor Avichin had a question in the second row. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Ava Chin, I'm a professor at the College of Staten Island uh, and also at the Graduate Center and I'm the author of the book Mott Street about the impact of the Chinese Exclusion Act laws on four generations of my family here in New York's Chinatown. Um, the question, I wanted to thank you for the work that you've been doing um, all these years. Um, and the, one of the, I have two questions for you. The um, one question is in terms of the Hidden Voices Project and the curriculum, um, I thought that it sounded so great about the the 30s or so profiles that you made, um, as well as the uh, the literature, um, the graphic novels. Um, have you also incorporate or thought about incorporating um, the personal stories, um, the first person accounts? Um, personal essays um, that touch upon all of these different aspects of the Asian American experience, because I found that through you know the personal lens, 
um, many readers feel connected to these much larger issues that happen societally. Um, and the second question really was directed uh, to John Liu, but maybe you can also touch upon this, um, <laughs> which is the hurdles um, for implementing the curriculum mm -hmm. um, in New York State. We know that New Jersey has passed legislation, but they're, all their different municipalities make the decisions, right? So if you can talk about the issues that are ahead for us as, New York, as a state uh, to implement this, um, it would, and how we as a community can also, of constituents, can also help. Um, so there's two, two sections to the question, thank you. So the, the question of kind of personal histories, oral histories, um, I think object histories in some cases. We have in, in some ways integrated that into the guide. Um, I think in particular in some of the choices we made in the profiles, these aren't all folks who, if you have an Asian American studies background, you would know, but someone like Pat Chin is, is someone, that's a very personal story, but a very important story. Um, so there is that piece even within the guide, but then as we're developing... So tell us who oh. Pat Chin is. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Chin is a Chinese Jamaican American music impersonario. Um, her and her husband founded a record, both store and studio in Kingston. They then moved to Queens. Um, I am blanking on the name of the label, Chris, VP Records, you thank you. Home? Um, and it is one of the central, still today, uh, reggae labels in the world. Um, yes, Go, you know, so, and going back to, and I think important, Chin and her husband did it the right way. I think some other folks who were working in Kingston, maybe not so much. Um, but one of the things, and I, I think this goes the story is a global story, but it is also a personal story for her. And so we actually called up VP Records, and she then was like, yeah, let me tell you. And I think one of the things that we got, that at least as far as we know, was nowhere else out there, was her husband's family. That they were, her, her husband's mother was biracial, uh, black Jamaican, and white. And then married a... Chinese labor, the, the descendants of Chinese laborers on Jamaica. And so all of this like very kind of minute history we were able to unearth, in this case, thanks to Chris, um, but then also thanks to connecting with this person who is still alive, who represents so much. So we're bringing it in that way. But then we're also through the lesson plans that we're developing. Some of those lessons we worked with uh, New York Historical Society, who had the Chinese Exclusion Inclusion ex Exhibition, I think maybe about six years ago, mm -hmm. using those materials to tell some of those stories, including, again, I'll go back to comics, including the um, person, yes. Uh, and we piloted those lessons, and the kids love them. And there's a teacher who has done just the most remarkable things already with the lessons, and so we're excited to get that in. We're working, and keep coming back to comics. I will always come back to comics. Um, we're working with a series of comic creators to build these six-page stories about their own family histories around a particular object. And those, our thinking is, we will eventually be able to develop lessons that students use those as a model to then go home and do the same thing with their own histories. So we are thinking about that. We will continue to think about that because I think that is a very important piece. Um, we're working with the Museum of Chinese in America. To, like, we're thinking about it. And so manga, I don't want to get too deep in the route. Yes, to some extent, but yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Oh wait, wait. So uh, <laughs> yes, the second part. The second part. Um, quickly. Yeah, quickly. <laughs> okay. There depends which side. So if you look at New Jersey. The issue is they have, and as I noted, they have written into law now that this needs to be taught. But the materials aren't out there for those districts to do it, so they're scrambling, quite frankly. Uh, Connecticut is doing it a little bit better, partly because of the folks who were working in Connecticut. Um, but they are also scrambling to get the materials into schools to support it. 
Uh, our issue is going to be because it's not mandated, and New York City, particularly with social studies, we will never mandate anything in terms of saying, you must teach this particular topic, you must use this textbook. And we could get into why that is. But instead, what we have done over time is, and this I led with this, when we started the Hidden Voices work, we intentionally connected it to our Passport to Social Studies. Why did we do that? Because the Passport to Social Studies is taught in 80% of K to 8 schools. And so part of the guide in every profile, we show where those profiles can be taught at the different grade levels in the Passport to Social Studies. We also, the questions that are developed for each profile, there are certain questions that tie directly to the larger curricular units so that when teachers come to their units of study, they have their units of study already and they can see very clearly, oh, I can bring in this profile at this point. Does that mean everything is perfect and we know that these 38 profiles are gonna be taught in K to 12? No, we're gonna have to continue the work. Part of that goes to the professional development, um, but there are definitely hurdles and there, it doesn't matter the, the model uh, that the state kind of goes. Thank you so much, Joe. I just wanted to take one second. Um, Chris Kwok, so uh, this dovetails with uh, Professor Avichin's question. So why did you actually pitch to have Pat John be included uh, in the volume? And so I was just wondering what brought you to that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, the study of uh, blacks uh, in the Caribbean along with the Asians that came after, uh, both from South Asia and from East Asia, mostly China, is not very well understood or studied in, uh, in America and in New York City. But we had large populations of both Caribbean blacks and from Jamaica, there was much mixture. And from learning about the colonial context, we can learn about the American context. And if we formalize them and we teach the histories, we're gonna get to uh, these, these very deep, uh, difficult lessons, because we live in a racialized country, but we don't often systematically learn about how it was created, why it was created, how we're, we're, we're playing within these contexts. Once you uh, teach them, uh, it, like if you look at it outside of your context, you can understand a little bit more, and then you understand it's not a, at all that different. And she was able to flow there in Jamaica, then Jamaica, Queens. You know, it's a wonderful story, you know, very quiet, under the radar. Uh, but we know her life story, we can learn from it and, and apply it to uh, our life. So that's why it's so important that's part of that curriculum. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I am going to close. I want to just say a few closing remarks um, uh, to thank you all for joining us today um, and to thank the amazing Roosevelt House staff. Um, to Mac Barrett, um, Justine, Justina Vitkoska, Daniel Culkin, Peter Scaflani, and Aaron Lee Feynman, to Angelica Calderon um, of Asian American Studies, to all of you for joining us today, to Joe, um, to Sen Senator John Liu, and uh, please continue the conversation upstairs at the reception. Thank you so much. Thank you.